Only 16 years after the end of a brutal U.S.-sponsored war that devastated El Salvador and its economy, Salvadoran market vendors find themselves victim of U.S. capitalist greed once again. In the 1970s, the Salvadoran government violently repressed the civilian groups that spoke out against extreme poverty and corruption. In response to their repression, the civilian groups formed the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front in 1980 and took up arms. The Salvadoran and U.S. governments saw the rebels as a Marxist threat to capitalism. The U.S. equipped and trained the Salvadoran government army, which kidnapped and disappeared more than 30,000 people and carried out large-scale massacres of thousands of old people, women, and children. Over 70,000 people died during the war, and countless human rights abuses occurred. Since the war ended, the U.S. has continued to intervene in Salvadoran affairs, supporting policies that have often been destructive for the people of El Salvador. After the war was over in 1992, uh, and the peace accords were signed in 1994, the country of El Salvador was devastated uh, from these 12 years of war. The infrastructure was uh, very weakened, and uh, the government was looking for any way that it could to, to try to rebuild it, that infrastructure. This is when uh, it started to accept, accept these structural adjustment loans from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, who, as I may have mentioned earlier, condition those loans on a complete restructuring of a country's economy to allow corporations to come in and take over. They provided jobs, but at what cost? Uh, completely exploited women working under inhuman conditions to make money that wasn't even enough to support themselves or their families, who were not allowed to join or form labor unions, who were prevented from taking too many bathroom breaks, who were not allowed to sing on the job, who were not allowed to have access to drinkable water while they were at work. And this was one of the first indications of uh, U.S. corporate control and domination in a place, a very vulnerable place like El Salvador, uh, that was a kind of a uh, precursor to the, the effects that NAFTA would later have in Mexico and that CAFTA continues to have uh, in, a, in El Salvador. Finally, for the Western Hemisphere, CAFTA would bring the stability and security that can only come from freedom. Today, a part of the world that was once characterized by oppression and military dictatorship now sees its future in free elections and free trade. CAFTA is the Central America Free Trade Agreement, uh, which uh, was passed by the U.S. Congress in 2005 and has been implemented um, between the U.S. and the Central American countries um, kind of on a one-at-a-time one, one basis since then. And the goal is to increase trade among the countries that are part of the, of the agreement by um, lowering tariffs and other barriers to trade and promoting foreign investment, mostly investment from U.S. corporations into Central America. The best way to achieve peace and prosperity for our hemisphere is by strengthening democracy and continuing the economic transformation of Central America and the Dominican Republic. The, the primary reason that CISPES and other groups in the United States and throughout Central America oppose the agreement is really due to its undemocratic nature. Well, CISPES sees the model of CAFTA as uh, an, uh, another attempt by the United States government in conjunction with uh, mega corporations in the U.S. To take advantage of both the livelihoods of people in El Salvador and those other countries involved, and to basically create a new playing field for corporations to uh, come in and dominate. Well, um, the market vendors are a an organization that formed uh, kind of in the aftermath of CAFTA's implementation in El Salvador. And what that organization was really a direct response to uh, one of the more troubling aspects of the agreement. Um, and um, par part of CAFTA was 
uh, mandated that the Central American countries had to increase the punishments in their own domestic laws for people who violated intellectual property rights. The market vendors specifically were responding to increased um, intellectual property protections for name brand uh, products such as CDs and DVDs, clothes, sunglasses, um, because there are tens of thousands of people in El Salvador who depend on um, income that is made by selling um, imitation or what, what we hear of as pirated goods. And so almost overnight this sort of work was made illegal in El Salvador with um, punishments and prison terms that were much harsher than other um, you know, violent crime in El Salvador. By transforming our hemisphere into a powerful free trade area, we will promote democratic governance, human rights, and economic liberty for everyone. As those new laws came into effect, um, the El Salvador's National Civilian Police um, regularly started uh, coming into marketplaces or to where street vendors were selling these sorts of goods and confiscating the goods, uh, setting fire to their stalls, provoking violent, con violent confrontations with the vendors, um, or um, destroying their goods. And a number of these vendors were arrested and charged under these new intellectual property laws that, the gov that El Salvador passed as one of the requirements of CAFTA. And so there's, um, you know, kind of these new legal pressures, but then also the, the police force that has gone into um, to enforcing these new laws has been, has been very violent. Um, and, and they've really kind of undertaken a series of very dramatic public sorts of, sort of operations to crack down on the vendors. So they're trying to make an example of them and trying to demonstrate not only to, to the vendors and to the rest of the Salvadoran community, but to um, international investors and corporations that they're very serious about cracking down on these sorts of folks. And so the market vendors were individuals um, and families who depended upon this sort of income for their livelihood. And they um, came together to try to seek alternatives from their government in terms of other kinds of work that they could have since this was, their jobs were now being criminalized, or um, to, tr to try to use their strength and numbers as a way to negotiate with uh, transnational companies that held these patents that um, they were now in violation of. I am honored to be here with six really fine leaders, people who have stood strong for democracy and who care deeply about the people of their nations. Um, so the, the Salvadoran government has defended its actions in cracking down on the street vendors um, by, by referring back to the obligations that it has under CAFTA. Um, you know, they, they say that they're party to this international agreement, which is really for the benefit of the Salvadoran people, and so um, they have to enforce these laws um, that have to do with intellectual property and piracy. Um, and they, they're their justification really stops there and what the the vendors have done is to publicly kind of go the next to the next step and ask the government well if that if that is your job whose interests are you defending are you defending the interests of your own people or are you defending the interests of these multinational corporations um, because th these laws really aren't in the aren't you know for the benefit of the Salvadoran people they're they're criminalizing the livelihood of tens of thousands of people um, just to protect the profits of some corporations that are mainly based in the U.S. So the government really has never been able to answer that question of, of how these laws are benefiting the Salvadoran people. Well, the, the government of El Salvador um, had a vested interest in allowing the U.S. and the U.S. corporations to get a much bigger foothold uh, in the country. There's a very uh, small percentage of um, uh, traditional families in El Salvador that for generations have really been uh, at, the, at the lead in the central government there. Um, for a little, for uh, a little while in El Salvador, they were known as the 14 families 
because these families dominated Salvadoran politics and they were absolutely the most affluent and rich people in that country, while the vast majority of Salvadorans are very poor and uh, suffering or jobless. Uh, so there's a vested interest by the financial elite in El Salvador to allow U.S. corporations to come in even more uh, to take advantage of resources because they stand to gain from it uh, many times because they're investors in those same corporations that are coming in to take over. first thing that they did was just come together and, and form an organization. Um, and so with kind of that combined voice and that power, they have, um, they entered into negotiations with the government trying to come up with a, a solution. Um, and they're very quick to say that they don't want to have illegal jobs. They don't want to be violating laws. You know, number one, they wish the laws didn't exist, but if they are going to exist, exist, they would love to have other options for work. Um, the fact is that in El Salvador those options just don't exist. And so they have um, tried to negotiate with the government for other, other alternative employment, um, for help with housing, for any sort of um, you know, job retraining or anything like that. They also um, asked the government to, s on their behalf, um, to try to negotiate with the companies that have the patents um, on things like music and movies. And um, so th the government um, got a response from these companies that, um, that they were offering to sell uh, CDs and DVDs to the vendors uh, for two or three dollars each. Um, but the price that they're selling, that the vendors are selling them for on the street is one dollar each. So it was, it was just very um, unrealistic. More recently, they have presented a series of um, proposals to the FMLN, which is the opposition political party in El Salvador. Um, and they met with that party's presidential candidate and um, presented their platform for what they think the government could do to support the, the informal sector. And um, they, were, they were very pleased with the response they got from that party. So um, that's a, a hopeful thing that they have been working on as well. As awful as conditions are in the on the ground in a place like El Salvador, the times that we have gone there and met with people, there is an incredible sense of hope in that country which is hard for me to get around my head sometimes, especially considering the level of, uh, of uh, war and military devastation and now the level of, of economic ruin in that country. There's a real sense in El Salvador from people that you meet and talk with that they'll get through this and that they'll find a way to create um, a new society for themselves. What, what we think it's important for people to do is first of all, um, to not think of these trade agreements as standalone issues, but to recognize that they are one, one way that our kind of globalized capitalism is, um, is not living up to the promises that, that it makes. Um, and from that understanding, to get involved not only in opposing one agreement or, or, or signing a postcard or calling your a congressional representative about one specific bill, but to get involved in, in you know, more committed, uh, dedicated organizing. And there are there are people in cities around the United States, in countries around the world, who are dedicated to, to not only oppose, as I said, not only opposing these specific laws, but into to to working on creating alternatives.
corporate media is often criticized for only going after the spectacular shots and the superficial stories and not bothering with the issues raised by demonstrators. Truth is, they don't even get the good shots. Crowbars and even their bare hands broke them and threw the chunks at the lines of riot police. Get the fuck out of here. For the good shots, as well as the whole truth, and the reasons behind the truth, we lie on the independent media. Um, people need to realize that uh, millions of people's votes are going and counted in presidential election after presidential election. It is affecting outcomes. It affected the outcome of our last two, uh, two major elections. Both elections, if the election had been run properly, if it had been run honestly, we would have a different president. And there is every reason in the world to believe that it's going to happen again in 2008 unless each one of us pay attention and get on board and do something about this issue. Everything we know about this election, everything about the turnout profile tells us the exit polls were right. George Bush lost this election. You know, I've, I've been in this business for 30 years, worked in television and then I've had my own company for 30 years. You know, for me, it was the 2004 election happened and the media took a hike. I mean, that was kind of the number one motivation for me is I'm, I'm sitting there looking at uh, the New York Times two days after the 2004 election and already there had been a lot of questions within the exit polls. There had been these horrific long lines and documented on network TV and all of that at, uh, in Ohio. And when Kerry quit, issue done. It was very much unlike 2000, and that scared me because it felt like there should have been major alarms going off. I'm trying to put together a popular-oriented book, and uh, as a preliminary, I've been listing the different ways that the election was stolen uh, in Ohio, and I've, uh, uh, at this moment I'm at 36. So uh, I expect to get to about 50. The irony is it's barely getting discussed in the media. And the main lesson, though, is as we go toward 2008, this is the issue we need to be looking at because it will affect the outcome of the election. There was a conference held in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm from Nashville. Uh, people from 30 states came, people who were concerned about what had happened in 2004 and wanted to do what they could to keep this from happening again in 2008. Okay, <laughs> I showed up at the conference and taped as much as I could with these people that I'd been reading, people I admired a lot, people doing the real frontline work on this issue. And once that's happened, I just kept going. And that began a two-year journey, really two-and-a-half-year journey, to complete this film. During the hours of 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., everyone was turned away during to, due to broken machines. What I saw uh, was voter intimidation in the form of city employees that were sent in to stop illegal parking. I attempted to vote um, in the same place that I voted in the primaries and was told that my name was not on the rolls. On Franklin County, there are no votes for David Cobb. Well, that's a problem. I voted for David Cobb. It was clear that something had happened that deserved to be put on the record. The election day process itself was a huge confuse. The lines were long, the machines were misallocated. Every... The first time I voted was very emotional for me. My parents had prepared me for the importance of it. And, uh, you know, I felt that sense of, as an 18-year-old, you know, when you feel like you have no power 
that curtain closes, this is the old lever machines, and you feel the power. You know, it's accountability time. You know, it's a time where you can say, you've done well, I want to keep you in. You've not done so well, you're out. You don't get my vote. It's a very empowering, wonderful experience that I think basically everybody shares. And that's why we, we you know, that's why it hurts when you think that the vote doesn't count sometimes. And uh, that's given me a lot of spirit to fight. This Republican strategy for maximizing the vote for their candidate by any means possible more than likely cost Senator Kerry the campaign. I'll be very clearly nonpartisan is that you know, Andrew Gumbel wrote a great book. It was called Steal This Vote, and it was a history of vote stealing in America. And it was throughout the entire history. It's part of our lore. It's Tammany Hall. It's, it's you know, Democrats controlling, uh, controlling uh, precincts throughout the South. It's, you know, it's been with us the whole time. And so, therefore, the only thing that makes it much scarier now is that you can do it, you don't have to do it ballot box by ballot box. It can be the security measures which are non-existent mean that you can change things on a tabulation level. You can shift millions of votes. One person can do it. That's what's scary about what we're in right now is the technology enables massive vote shifting. I see a great day coming for our country and I am eager for the work ahead. God bless you. And may God bless America. We see all these iceberg tips of anomalies, one after another. And guess what? Virtually all of them favoring George Bush. What I'd like to call the power of one, how one person over and over again makes a big difference. And that's what is encouraging to me is our system is not so onerous that one person can't be like that modern times Charlie Cha Chaplin movie where the bolt goes into the big system and it clogs it up. And that's been very encouraging for me. The spectacle is a concrete inversion of life. An autonomous movement of the non-living. In societies dominated by modern conditions of production, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived has receded in your representation. The images, detached from every aspect of life, merge into a stream in which the unity of that life can no longer be recovered. Fragmented views of reality regroup themselves into a new unity as a separate pseudo world that can only be looked at. The specialization of images of the world evolved into a world of autonomous images where even the deceivers were deceived. The spectacle, like modern society itself, is at once united and divided. The unity of each is based on violent divisions. While men's contradiction emerges in the spectacle, he is itself contradicted by a reversal of his meaning. The division he presents its unitary, while the unity it presents its divine In all of its particular manifestations, news, propaganda, advertising, entertainment, the spectacle represents the dominant model of life. It is the omnipresent affirmation of the choices that have already been made in the sphere of production and in the consumption implied by that production. 
The spectacle cannot be understood as a mere visual deception produced by mass media technologies. It is a world you have that actually been materialized. If you live on a world that that become objective. In analyzing the spectacle, we are obliged to a certain extent to use the spectacle's own language, in the sense that we have to operate on the methodological terrain of the society that expresses itself in the spectacle. Revolutionary theory is now merely a revolutionary ideology, and it knows it. We are now the spectacle and the spectacle is now us. We have a look at the now world, we need to solve that world by rushing the self-deceased, and the business, and us. 